episode, I am going to not only address, but I am going to actually demonstrate the second most popular method of gem and diamond setting, and that would be bezel setting. Prong setting being the most popular, bezel setting right behind it. Very safe way to do uh, a gemstone or diamond for especially if you're hard on wear, but it's a much more technical and difficult type of stone setting to do. I'm going to demonstrate the tool that was used in the past and the tool that is used in the present. We have a 2.23 carat, very unique bicolor cabochon cut sapphire. You can see that very uh, unusual clear streak down the center flanked by blue on either side. I thought what better mounting than something simple that would show off the stone and I went with this custom made um, European style shank mounting that requires it to be bezel set. There are two types of bezel setting. There is a bezel that has a raised wall and that is one that is very easy to push the wall over and around the gem. But in this style we're going to be demonstrating today, the metal is drawn or pushed, so to speak, from the mounting itself. This requires a very well cut wax that it starts with to match the stone and then a fine touch of cleaning the seat out, in other words, the base that the stone will rest on, leaving only a little bit of room that the metal will need to be moved over. The stone fit very well into the mounting, leaving only a little bit of room around the outside that the metal will need to be moved inwards and over it. And you say, well, how is this accomplished? Well, the way I learned it a good uh, three to four decades ago was the old fashioned way. And that was to take a tool such as this and you would bring the tool up to the edge of the metal and you strike it with a hammer and you slowly do it from one side to the next and go all the way around it multiple times, moving that metal in equally. This was very effective and very safe so that the um, much less chance of any breakage of the stone, but slow and tedious. The modern way now is when you may have heard this term, hammer set and they have created a couple of different hammer hand pieces that are uh, will strike it through the use of a motorized force and at different rapid paces and what this will do as I place it up next to it in uh, for demonstration purposes is move up and down real quickly and help pneumatically almost hammer set that metal and push it in via me only holding this and directing it instead of two hands and the ring in a clamp. This though presents its own set of issues. It is very easy to slip. It is also only takes one miss strike of that hammer hand piece to hit or make contact with the stone and it very high chance of will be broken. Not only is there a control device in the hammer hand piece itself to regulate the um, hitting force of the tip, but there's something that is much more of a control factor and that is what the ring is resting against. If you put it on something such as a ring mandrel, when the hammer hand piece strikes, the old law um, says that if it can't move anywhere, all the force will be directed right on the spot that is hit and it'll move the metal the furthest. If you go ahead and take the ring and if you put it against something of wood, even something just like this, and then use the hammer hand piece, the wood is an in-between medium where it allows a little bit of give 
and therefore is kind of a medium um, amount of movement to the metal. The slowest, but possibly the safest, is to just hold it in your hand. Of course, not only does the flesh give, but the finger and hand will as well as it strikes. This is my preferred method, especially at the start until I realize exactly the hardness of the gold because each different carat and each different alloy will have its own amount of malleability or give that until you strike it with a piece of metal, you don't know exactly how soft the metal is. As I said, there's a couple of different hand pieces they make. I've opted to go with this particular one, which is a Swiss made one. It actually is a, has a very powerful um, hit to it, so to speak, and really will move the metal quickly. I would not choose this if it was a softer stone or anything like an emerald, but because this gem is a corundum, I am going to go ahead and at least lock the stone in with it, so to speak, which is hitting it on either side on the ends. Now I'm going to hand hold this again till I can see what exactly and how soft the metal is. It's almost invisible, but if you notice, I keep my finger on the piece that is moving up and down. This is also a, uh, this also gives me the ability to not only feel the amount of pressure that it's striking, but also to control it. And as you can barely see the movement in it, it certainly leaves an impression. Okay, I've moved it in far enough to realize that I think I'm, I can uh, use a harder substance behind it so that metal moves faster yet. Uh, I can be a little bit of a cowboy when it comes to some of these things when I would recommend to everybody to move at your own pace, take a lot of time in this process uh, it's just that um, I, I sometimes uh, feel a little bit more confident having the experience and can uh, feel confident to do a little bit more, be a little more aggressive. And you can hear the difference again. So it was a real fine line between when at the point that it still comes out of the mounting and at the point that it, it's tight. And once you hit that point when it tight, tightens and locks up, then you're good to go. What that does is it will show off the maximum diameter of the stone, creating what appears like uh, almost invisibly set. All right, I see that I need to just do a little bit more on the ends and we're going to hit that point. All right, as you can see, the stone isn't bouncing out and it's not shaking loose. If there was a chance of that stone not being tight or coming out, this would make it do so. The action of this hammer hand piece is violent. and unforgiving as I said and it will certainly bounce a stone out if it is not in there correctly. I have it on a softer hit as I'm working just a little closer to the stone and actually just evening up some of the metal uh, indentations made by the handpiece and it will burnish it, so to speak, to where it actually will make it easier for me to clean up and finish with less metal loss.
Now at this point, I have a decision to make. I can make what appears like what I call a hat rim around the stone by keeping that flat look, or I can blend it in with the rest of the mounting. I may consider adding diamonds down the sides. I haven't decided yet. So if I'm going to do that, I think I'm going to blend in this edge so it doesn't quite look like a hat rim so much. The reason being, your eye is going to tend to be drawn to the reflectiveness of that instead of the center stone. And this is how we do it. We go and we remove that sharper edge, continuing around the ring thereby keeping with the original intent of the design. The hammer setting forces the metal into a flattened position like that. But the goldsmith has to restore the design And all that, again, is gained and gained through experience, technique, knowledge, and more experience. Now you don't see, even in the brushed form, that rim around it so much. And in our next step of finishing it, it will even become more so less pronounced. We've gone to a wheel that will remove the scratches but also will not scratch the sapphire very important because this wheel is what's going to help create that really smooth edge around the stone and what will help make it look invisibly set in a way. All right, we're just about complete. with using this particular wheel. Go in with some closer magnification. If you skip a, a process now, you're just gonna have to come back to it. So better to do it right each step of the way. This takes time, but it's part of creating jewelry the right way. Okay, about time for a uh, pre-polish from the bench. And then see if we have to clean up anything from there. So let's go to the next tool. This tool I've chosen will actually give me a polish finish. It also will allow me to see if there's any uneven areas that need to be cleaned up at the bench before we move to the final stage of the buffing wheel. Mostly I'm looking for waviness or an uneven portion of the bezel. Now, since this is handmade jewelry, you have to expect 
it to look handmade and part of that is and are natural um, parts of it that aren't uniform or exactly perfect and that's what I used to tell the clients is do you want a mass produced piece that is something that is stamped out and every piece looks the same or do you want an individually made piece handcrafted but yet may have some human um, errors so to speak or flaws or imperfections in it because it was handmade and of course I think everyone would choose something to be handmade and allow for the humanity of that outcome. A real artist knows when they've made something less than. It just has to be an artist that doesn't have an ego so large that they can't admit it when they have. Somehow, ego and artisans tend to go hand in hand, but at some point, it can be detrimental to the work itself. Finishing up nicely. Now, let's just take it to the buffer and we're done. Now to clean it. Wow. You just got to see and experience a very difficult and unique technique to stone setting and I hope you can appreciate everything involved to be able to set a stone like that next time you see one especially one that is down in the mounting like that much more goes into it I know than you thought and that's what I wanted to show you all the other nuances and difficulties and metallurgy that goes into an act of setting a beautiful stone like that. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and thank you for joining me behind the bench. I can't wait to see you again.